We started last week in Hosea, and uh, so I, I was looking through chapter two this week, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull one part of this out. We're gonna talk about it, and we'll go to uh, chapter three next week. Now, this is a prophetic book. Hosea is a prophet. God is using Hosea and this this really a prostitute named Gomer to identify. Israel with her, okay, and God's going to kind of show us who he is through Hosea. And when I mean prophetic, when we read this verse 13, I am going to read 14 and 1. I know I didn't give it to you, but it's, it's almost as God is just a, a pinball or a ping pong ball. But you have to understand in prophecy, it doesn't mean that it's, it's going to happen right then. Okay, when God changes his mind, when God, you know, a lot of this is dealing with when Jesus died, okay, and some of it is dealing with in the millennial. So, get this. But in all of this, like I said, the Bible wasn't written to us, it was written for us. In all of this, we're going to extract something out that's going to hit every one of us today, including this old boy speaking to you. You ready? good. Hosea 2, say to your brothers, you're my people, your sisters, you have received mercy, plead with your mother, plead for she is not my wife and I'm not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face, her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst Upon her children also I will have no mercy because they are children of whoredom, for their mother has played the whore. We, we're about to get the picture, aren't we? <laughs> so she conceived them. So she who conceived them has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and water, and my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Therefore I will hedge up her, with, uh, her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. Kind of see a picture? Her first husband is portrayed through Hosea, but it's representing God. We know one day Israel is going to come back. All right. There you go. That was free. Watch this. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for bell. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time, my wine in its season. I will take my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. I will put an end to all her mirth, her feast, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and her appointed feast. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast of the days of bells, period, uh, plural, bells. When she burnt offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and her jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me declares the Lord what's this verse 14 therefore behold I will lure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly with her and I will give her her vineyards and my, what he's being prophetic don't forget that don't think God's like schizophrenic I think I will I think I won't no, he's going, and hey, I'm going to do all this. And by the way, there will be a day I will bless them. They'll return to me. Yeah. All right. Now, with all that said, here it is. Verse 2 starts with plead with your mother. Watch, watch, the, watch the desperation in God. It, it's, 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 God is given a picture of this family right where the husband and the or the dad he's out of options with his unfaithful wife 
And so in a last-ditch effort, he turns to his children and says, would you go plead with your mother? Maybe she'll listen to you. Maybe she'll see the tears in your eyes. Maybe she will see what she's doing to you by leaving for weeks and months at a time and coming back bruised up and, and, and thin and, and beaten. Maybe she'll listen to you. And maybe your words can penetrate her hard heart. And God has given us a picture of how he feels about Israel at this point in time, what they're doing at this point in time. And they are not listening to God. They're not, their hearts are so hard against him. And each verse leads us from here, leads us deeper into how far God and how far from their minds God is. And, and we're going to take a verse and we're going we're gonna to build on this. It's verse 5. They had reached a point to where what God had done for them and provided for them because, you know, he says, I, I gave you your vineyards. I gave you your grain. I gave you your wine. I gave you your silver and gold. But you somehow forgot that and didn't realize that because she says you know I'm giving someone else credit for what God did watch this they were participating in idolatry and in verse 5 she says I will go after my lovers who gave me my bread who gave me my water who gave me my wool who gave me my flax my oil and my drink and God's saying, you have come so far, you have come so far that you feel like all the blessings that you have got is coming from somebody else. And now you're worshiping, right, the blessings, and you forgot the blesser. They were participating in idolatry. Uh, in our day, when we hear idolatry or idols, we think of some statue, right? Uh, we think of a statue, a figure that someone is bowing down before, that they're worshiping. And so when we hear this, and today you're going to go, yeah, I should have stayed home and prayed for the cowboys. But uh, <laughs> when we hear this, when we hear the word idol, we give it no thought, right? We, we think, I. <laughs> I don't worship idols. Right? I mean, no, not me. That was then. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But they had, they had a lot of gods in that. Now, I'll give you a few of them. Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the god of beauty. So, in other words, if you want to be more beautiful, you would take a sacrifice to the god of Aphrodite. And she'd give you some lotion. She didn't do that. She, she was dead. It was a... Uh, there's Ares, the god of war. So you're about to go to war, you go make that sacrifice to Ares, and uh, he would guarantee you victory. Artemis, the goddess of fertility and wealth. If you needed some fertility, you needed some wealth, you'd go make a bell. There was many bells, but Bell was really the ultimate fertility god. Uh, Ashtoreth, you wanted to get a blessing from Ashtoreth, you would take a child and go sacrifice it to Ashtoreth. Uh, Zeus in the book of Acts. I got a dog named Zeus. I didn't name him Zeus. Uh, the god of lightning, thunder, and rain. But it does make sense because he hates lightning, thunder, and rain. Uh, Tartarus, the god of the underworld, death. So they had all these gods. This is just, just the tip of the iceberg of all the gods they had. Uh, we read these. And we in our modern day Western world say, <laughs> I hope somebody else is listening in here because this isn't me. Right? But this I know every culture, every generation is dominated by its own set of idols. Each one has its rituals. Each one has its shrines, its office buildings, its office towers, its gymnasiums, its stadiums, its bank accounts. 
where a sacrifice must be made in order for our particular idol to bless us back. We we may not physically kneel before the statue of Aphrodite, but many young women today are driven into depression by an obsession over their body image in comparison to the ones that they see on social media. Right? And they look at how many likes this person who has some kind of genetic advantage. And they look at their likes and go, if I could only be like her, they would all like me. And it drives them into depression because they worship that, right? We may not be burning incense incense to Artemis, but when money and career are at the forefront... We sacrifice our children, our marriage, our home life to achieve more wealth and prestige. So we can say, look what I got. We buy homes we can't afford and drive cars we can't afford. But we don't worship idols. The Bible teaches us that anything can become an idol. And I'll tell you, everything has been an idol to somebody. So what is an idol? Let's let's talk about this. Anything, 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 you get this? Anything that absorbs our hearts and our imagination more than God. Anything. Anything we seek to give us what only God can give. It's anything in our life that if we should lose it, we would feel that our life no longer is worth living or has meaning. It's anything that we look at and in our heart of hearts say, if I have that, I would have meaning. I don't know if I'm real loud out there, but I am just cooking fried chicken up here. You might can take a little of this monitor out. I think it's up here. I'm trying to whisper, and it's just blowing me out. Is it loud up there or is it here? It's up here? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. We're getting there. There we go. Yeah, it was like I was filling my words. Anyway. Like, man. Either that's the Holy Spirit or this is loud. So... We just found out it wasn't the Holy Spirit because he got fixed. (laughs) Anything that we look at, that's much better. I feel like I can exert myself now. (laughs) Anything that we look at, anything that we look at, either something we have or something we desire, if we have it, we say, "If, if, if I ever lose this, life will not be worth living, or if I can just get that or her or someone like him, I had somebody tell me one time, if I could only, me and my husband together, if we could only make $70,000 a year, we would just be satisfied. Now they're $150,000. And you know what? Why? We can call this by many names, but the bottom line is the Bible calls it something we worship. The Bible breaks it down to three things. Number one, we love our idols. Number two, we trust our idols. And number three, ultimately obey our idols. Because every one of them asks something of us. Here's what I know. Whatever controls George Gall is George Gall's Lord. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives, whoever or whatever that is. Some of you need to start finding your identity and what Christ thinks about you. If you can, listen to me, I struggled with this for years, right? Maybe I've gone too far the other way with that. 
I used to care what everybody thought about me. I would, I would weigh my messages through, if, well, I wonder if this is going to offend somebody. Look, if you're not offending somebody, you're not telling the truth. Amen. Right? I mean, you, Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you. That means you people pleasing. Right? So, if you could ever find out and get it in your heart what Christ thinks of you, what God thinks of you through Christ, Listen, you would find your identity and your hope and everything that you're seeking for. And it doesn't matter what Chris Cruz thinks about me. And I love Chris Cruz. I've known Chris since he was in diapers. But if Chris don't like me, I can go to my father and know what he feels about me. And I really get to the place that I don't give a flip. And some of you need to get to the place where you don't give a flip. Because of what God thinks about you, right? And you can crush that out of people-pleasing, right? And you would, listen to me, you would even cancel social media because you would quit fishing for likes. And you'd start really fishing for fish. Maybe you'd switch fishing. (laughs) But whoever it is that we're trying to please controls or whatever it is, will control your life. Every human being, is to create, we're created to live for something. It's in us. Something must capture our imagination. Something must capture our allegiance. And something must give us hope. Something. Book of Genesis records one of my favorite stories about a man named Abraham. Genesis 12 God says to Abraham, I will bless all the nations of the earth through you and your descendants. But for this to happen, God says to Abraham, I want you to leave your country, I want you to leave your people, I want you to leave your father's house, and I want you to go to the land that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. That's blind faith. He didn't say, I want you to go to Evadel. He said, I want you to leave and just start walking. Just start walking. God asked Abraham to leave everything he was familiar with. His friends, his family, everything he believed believed that meant safety and prosperity, peace and security. And he said, I just want you to just go to the wilderness and just in, in, in an uncertain destination. God asked him to give up what is in every, every person's heart. And everything that he desired, and he did. He went even though he didn't know where he was going. But while God asked him that he give up other hopes, God gave him a new hope. Watch this. Genesis 12, 7, all the nations will be blessed through your offspring. That means children, right? That meant his wife Sarah would have to have a child. But up to now, he'd been throwing a no-hitter. Years turned into decades. And God's promise seemed to be harder to believe. Finally, after Abraham was over 100, Sarah was... Over 90, Genesis 17, 17 says she gave son, birth to a son, Isaac. Isaac means laughter. We have a grandson named Isaac. They named him right. He's the most hilarious kid. You don't know it's going to, sometimes you're on pins and needles around strangers because you don't know and he's just pure hearted and he just might ask. Who knows? <laughs> but he's funny. You know, but he, they name him Isaac and it means laughter. And so what was so funny well, if you got pregnant in your 90s, I'd laugh. <laughs> I mean, you have to have a sense of humor, God. But their laughter was joy as well, right? The years of waiting had been, you know, had to be agonizing. It had to be taking a toll on them, you know, 
like we do. We'll tell somebody, yes, God promised me that. Could you imagine all the people you told about that? God came out, just this angel came I tell you, it was the most amazing thing, and, and, and said I was going to have a child. You know he had to tell that because that's what church people do. Right? The endless days of refining Abraham's faith by holding on to a promise that seeing nothing and how you feel then, Sarah. Night after night of acting in faith when nothing was happening. Abraham longed for a son. He had left everything, given up everything to wait for this. Having a son would prove to his family and friends that he wasn't a fool to give up everything and leave, blindly follow God. He had waited and sacrificed. Finally, he was here. This little boy. Isn't he beautiful? No, they're ugly. When they're born. Oh, it's so beautiful. No. Right? Unless you had a C-section kid, then they're fine. The ones who had to fight for their entrance when they're ugly. But the question is this. Had he done all the waiting and sacrificing because God asked him to? Or had he done all the waiting and sacrificing because he wanted a boy? Was God just a means to an end? Now, I'm a pastor. You know that. And there are people, not a woman in first service, who the only time you see them or hear from them is when they need a bell out from God. He's, he's not a heavenly father. He's a sugar daddy. Right? Is Abraham doing what he's doing because God asked him to? Or is he doing it and waiting because he really wants a son that bad? Who was Abraham ultimately giving his heart to? Had Abraham learned to trust God alone, to love God for himself, not just what he could get out of God? If the story ends right now, we would never know. We would never know. If the story ends here, we would think Abraham's faith, long-suffering, had triumphed. Now he could die a happy man, having left everything to go and wait for a son to be born. Surely his mission was complete. He got it. There was a smell of Similac in the house. Dirty diapers. Right? But then comes Genesis 22 in verse 1. After these things... God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, Abraham said, here, here I am. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. It was his night. <laughs> right? Abraham, yes, Lord. Come on, boy, Bert. He said, take your son your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him. There is a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Watch. Watch Abraham. I would, I would have bargained with God. I'd have, I'd have done a 10-week fast. I'd have done a prayer chain. I'd, I'd, I'd actually got on one of them TV shows on the church channel and, and bought some of that water. <laughs> so Abraham rose early the next morning. It's idle test time. See, God will always test our idols. Isaac was everything to him. 
God's call magnifies this more. Watch. God doesn't say take Isaac and go to Moriah. Watch. He says take your son, your only son, whom you love. God was pointing out the obvious. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. You you don't have a, a duplicate. Abraham's affection had become adoration. Abraham's meaning in life had been dependent on God's word. Now was it becoming dependent on Isaac's love and well-being? God was not saying you cannot love your son. But God was saying is it is possible to turn someone you love into an idol and to counterfeit God and an object of worship. In our culture, an adult's identity and sense of worth is often bound up in our abilities and our achievements. Look what I got, look what I drive, look what I have, look, 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 look at my woman, look at him. Right, isn't it? Come on, nobody goes, oh, wow, they got kids. Gosh, I want to be like them. Somebody told me the other day that, uh, you know, kidney stones is like having a child. I said, I totally disagree. Because women say all the time, I'd love to have another kid. I've never heard a man say, I think I want another kidney stone. <laughs> Anybody? If you are, talk to me. You're, you're weird. But in Abraham's time, all the hopes and dreams of a man and his family rested in the firstborn son. It was the firstborn son was everything. To take a firstborn son was to take the family's wealth and place in society. It was, it was, we don't get that here. Right? It'd be taking like taking your, you know, Mercedes and giving you a 79 Yugo. If you don't know what that is, Google it. When God, watch this, you remember the story in Egypt, right? When God's telling Pharaoh, let my children go, let my children go, and nothing worked, frogs. Now, a lot of you women would have tapped out when frogs came. You're like, he's God. You know, boils, locusts, eating everything. I mean, just the water turned into blood. None of that, none of that worked. The ultimate punishment, right, was taking the lives of the firstborn. Their firstborn received the majority of the family's wealth, so he was the family's future. We don't get that in our culture. Like, I just want another one. The firstborn, guinea pig, he gets whipped for nothing. The baby don't, he used to kill me for that. Well, <laughs> we learned. God says he wants to bless the world through Isaac. How can God be holy? How can God be just? And how can God still fulfill his promise of salvation? Through Abraham. Abraham didn't know, but he took Isaac anyway. How did Abraham walk up that mountain with his son in obedience to God? Genesis 22, 5 gives us a hint. He tells his servants, you just stay right here. We we are going to come back to you. Abraham didn't go up the mountain saying, I can do it. He wasn't filled with power and self-talk. Look at me, watch me, follow me. He said, we'll be back, God will do it. So he took Isaac, built an altar, laid his son on top of the wood, pulled back the knife. You notice there's no hesitation in Abraham's faith ever? I'd have actually fumbled the knife, kicked it, given God time. He pulls the knife back and God speaks from heaven, don't lay a hand on the boy. Now, I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son, whom you love. This word fear doesn't mean being afraid of God. It means to be totally committed to God. Now I know that you fear me. It means now I know you're totally committed to me. 
God was saying, now I know you love me more than anything in this world, even your son, your only son, whom you love. As long as Abraham never had a chance to choose between his son and his obedience to God, Abraham could not see that his love was becoming idolatrous. And until he felt what he felt when God asked him to give it up, when he felt that, that's when he knew, I love this boy, but I'm starting to worship this boy. It's only in the fear of losing something, please hear me, do we realize how much we worship it. So God, doing what God does, he sends a ram as a substitute sacrifice for Isaac. He pulls it back. Don't do it. Hey, look over there. (laughs) Right? Hung up in a bush. If you never raise goats, they they can get hung up on a leaf. Many years later, many years later, in those same mountains, another firstborn son was stretched out on the wood to die. But on Mount Calvary, When Jesus, the Son of God, cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father stood aside and he watched. There was no sacrifice substitute that day. There was no sacrifice substitute lamb that day for Jesus because he was the substitute sacrifice for us. He died to bear our punishment. So here is the antidote to our idols and our Isaacs in our lives. We need to trust and love God to the point we are willing to offer them up sacrifice to him and not, we're not he's not asking you to sacrifice your kids anymore some of you got excited <laughs> he will never do that okay i have to clarify that i'm being hypothetical we must not clutch them too tightly some of you that have got took your job today there's a good chance you would end your life Some of you lost your dear lease. If God looked at Abraham and said, because you didn't withhold your son, your only son from me, now I know you love me. Please, please hear me here. How much more can we look at his sacrifice on the cross and say to God, now we know how much you love us. Because you didn't withhold your son, your only son, whom you love, from us. When the magnitude of what he did finally hits us, it makes it easy to rest our hearts, our hopes in him, rather than anything this earth has to offer. Now, think of the many disappointments and troubles that face us. If we're honest today, and normally you are, we will realize, if we're honest, that the most agonizing of them have to do with our own Isaacs. In all of our lives, there's always some things that we invest in and receive a level of joy and fulfillment, hope, security. And the most painful times in our lives is when our Isaacs and our idols are being threatened or removed. We can get bitter. We can feel entitlement. And we can say, I've worked hard for all this. It can cause us to feel at liberty to lie and cheat and leverage, to throw away our principles in order to get some relief. To do, it, it can cause crazy things when your idols get threatened. Or like Abraham, we can take a walk up the mountain and say, I see you're calling me to live my life and give up something I thought I could never live without. But I, if I have you, I have the only wealth, health, love, security I really need and cannot lose. And sometimes it seems like God is killing us when he's really saving us. He was making Abraham into a great man. But from the outside, it looked like God was being cruel. And like Abraham, Jesus had a struggle with God's call. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked their father, the father, is there any way out? And, but in the end, he obediently walked up Mount Calvary to the cross And we can't always know why our Father allows certain things in our lives. 
But like Jesus, we can trust him in those times. Okay. I would love to say that comes naturally. It doesn't. But until you get an understanding of who God is, You can't fully grasp it. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a study right now, and maybe it'll be ready next year, on did God cause this? Did God cause this? And I'm not, I'm, it's, not even, it's not even in the oven, so I'm not going to give you a lie, but it's something. And it all goes back to this. It's what I'm coming up with. Where, if we can ever get a picture of his heart and who he is, that's really what will matter. Right? If, if, you, if you ever get that, and you get that through Jesus, you get that through Jesus' life. He's a picture of the Father, right? So, uh, yeah. What is it? I, I, I'm going to challenge you this week, and I'm done. I'm overtiming, and I'm sorry. Um, pray a dangerous prayer. This week, every morning when your feet hit the floor, God reveal my idols. Because some of you are saying, I don't have them. A lot of you are thinking, oh, man, I can't really think of nothing. You know, man, is, maybe next week it hit me. Pray this. Holy Spirit, reveal to me what you see that I worship. Because what's this? She didn't know it was I who gave her. She was depending on something else. What is it that gives me my identity, that gives me my security, that gives me whatever? Pray that prayer, I dare you. I dare you. Why? Because we don't need that mess in our lives. Right? Right? A lot of us serve camouflage idols. You can't see them. Like, the, like some of these guys on the side of a tree this morning. Deer urine on them. It's a lot of our idols. Pray that prayer. What is it? Show me. He will. He wants to. Stand. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Who directs, who comforts, who corrects. Who, Lord, I, we, we lean into you. What is it that is in competition with you in our lives? What is it? Is it someone? Is it something? Is it an achievement? What is it that is in competition with you being the Lord of our lives? What is it? Reveal that to us. Reveal it. Make it as plain as writing on a paper to each of us. Illuminate that. Why? Because, God, we don't want anything taking the place of our relationship with you. Taking the place of you being our provider and you being our supplier and you being our, our father. You, Lord, we don't want anything taking that place. Reveal it to us. And then, Holy Spirit, give us the wisdom to know what to do with it. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. You're not finished with us. Actually, you're just beginning. We want to walk free of idols. We want to walk free of baggage. We want to walk free of that. And we want to see you clearly. And to know that you have our best interest at hand. You're not trying to destroy us. You're not trying to kill us. You're not trying to defeat us. You're trying to exalt us. You want to use us. And so, God, what is it that's hindering that? We'll receive it with an open heart. In Jesus' name.